I'm Cece Williamson. And I'm Ann Steiner. Today we are here to tell you about the greatest cooking invention since fire, microwave ovens, which are now in over 50% of the homes in America. There are more microwaves than dishwashers in homes, and they're the top selling appliance, having surpassed sales of washers, dryers, and refrigerators. We think that microwaves are number one because they give us back some of the precious time we've lost to our busy schedules. Microwave ovens, once a novelty, have become a necessity. Today, you are able to cook with less bother and less fuss. From cheesecakes to Cornish hens, the meals you make are delicious to eat and a breeze to prepare, especially if you know the secrets. And after today, perfect results will no longer be a mystery. As home economists, we have made microwaves our only business. Perhaps you have seen our microwave cooking column, microscope, in the food section of your local newspaper. We travel quite a bit teaching microwave cooking classes, and what surprises us is how many people only use a small percentage of a microwave's capabilities. The things everybody seems to microwave are leftovers, water, bacon, and baked potatoes. Today, we'd like to take you beyond baked potatoes. We have also seen eating habits change all across the nation, and the microwave oven is a natural, especially for people serious about healthy cooking. Good nutrition is really important to living a healthy life, and a microwave oven can make it easy to prepare nutritious meals quickly. The recipes we will demonstrate for you have an emphasis on sound nutrition. At the end of each recipe, there will be a nutrition chart that outlines the calories, cholesterol, and other basic elements. We hope these will be valuable in helping you plan a diet that fits your lifestyle. Of course, many microwave techniques are based on conventional cooking knowledge. What we teach you today will emphasize how to get the taste of good home cooking with a minimum of time and fuss. So come on, join us. Let's get microwaving. Chicken is one of our favorite family entrees to prepare, and it's fast becoming a favorite of everyone's. We're going to share with you today how you can easily and quickly prepare in your microwave oven a healthy entree dish. Cece, we're going to first of all need to weigh our chicken because the label fell off at the grocery store. So we see that we have almost two and a half pounds of chicken that we're going to be preparing. We've already thawed our chicken, but perhaps you need to thaw your chicken before preparing it. We're going to remove the shrink wrap that comes from the grocery store, and we would recommend that you also take the chicken pieces off of the foam insulated tray that it comes packaged upon. This way, we're going to more efficiently be able to defrost our chicken. We are then going to recommend that we skin the chicken because we can certainly cut down the calories. We will have approximately 50 fewer calories per serving if we remove the skin from our chicken. And I found it's really helpful if I can get a paper towel in hand before I start to skin the chicken. You know, one of the reasons that we take the shrink wrap off of the packaging from the store is that shrink wrap that the butchers use contains PVC or polyvinyl chloride. This is a storage wrap and it's not made to cook with either in the microwave or any other kind of oven. And the reason we take the, f the foam tray off the chicken is that it's just like an ice bucket. You know when you have a party you put ice in an ice bucket to keep it frozen. But if you're trying to defrost chicken you don't want to put it in an ice bucket because it will hinder the defrosting of it. So that's one reason we remove all the packaging when we're defrosting chicken. Whenever we cook the chicken in the microwave, it's helpful if we can have our pieces be uniform size. So we disconnect the thigh and the drumstick rather than leaving them joined together. And if we're using a breast, then we recommend cutting the breast so that we have two halves rather than an entire breast. Now we've got a wing here, and this little thin bony part is going to really cook too fast in the microwave oven. So I'm going to tuck it beneath, and we're going to have a neat little package of chicken. Now our coating 
is something that I make up in quantity and do it in a bag so that I can keep it stored in the freezer at all times. First of all, we'll put in some cornflake crumbs. And then we have some seasoned breadcrumbs. And in here we have some paprika and garlic salt, tarragon, basil. Whoops, we missed that. So we'll just take our tongs here and loosen that. And some oregano. And we can shake this all. And then we will have it so that we can coat our chicken pieces easily in the bag. You know, this is really nice to be able to use our own homemade mix because in the commercially prepared ones, we sometimes have some additives that we don't know what they really are. And we also have salt and sugar. So we're going to be able to have what we feel are going to be more de a more nutritious coating by making our own and you know exactly what you're putting in it. You know, that's a neat looking dish you've got there. What is this? This is one of Rubbermaid's freeze, heat, and serve dishes. And with this, we can use it repeatedly, as well as going from the freezer to the microwave oven to the table. So you melted the butter right in there? Directly in that, and then we'll be able to uh, use it for other things as well, because it is reusable. One of the things is it's really fun to cook, but it's no fun to clean up. And so when you can have a dish that has several purposes before you have to wash it, to us, that's a real winner. Of course, microwave dishes are a lot easier to clean because the, you don't have the baked on um, crust around the outside that's difficult. A pair of tongs will certainly help you to get the uh, chicken coated and keep your hands clean in the process. And by using our bag, we can just do our own shaking directly in the bag here. Now, how much did you say this chicken weighed when we were weighing it? We had it? just about two and a half pounds, but we have to remember that when we have skinned the chicken, we're going to have less weight. So we need to weigh our chicken after we have skinned it. When you're microwaving poultry, you calculate the cooking time at six to seven minutes per pound of poultry. And this is true if you're doing chicken or uh, Cornish hens or turkey, or even a duck. And, um, but it is important to weigh it after you remove the skin. When you remove the skin, that reduces the amount of fat in the chicken by 50%. And so that's really where most of the fat in the chicken is. So if you're trying to eat healthy, you should always skin the chicken um, before eating it. For cooking our chicken, we recommend covering it with wax paper. This is going to hold in the heat, but we're not going to have droplets of moisture dripping down onto our crumb coating. And we're using a rack because this is going to elevate the chicken pieces and give a more uniform, crispy texture to the exterior coating. So we will cover this and we have approximately two pounds of prepared chicken pieces that we're going to microwave. Cece is going to place it in the microwave, allowing six minutes per pound on high. Poultry is tender and we can cook it on high power very effectively. I think probably in a few minutes we can see our finished product. Cece, I hear the beep and I think our chicken might be done. Let's check it. Ooh, that looks good. It really does. But we're going to have to allow it to have the standing time before we can eat it. And we would recommend that we use one third of the cooking time and you touched in 12 minutes. So we're going to have to allow four minutes of standing time before we can test our chicken for complete doneness. One reason it's important to allow foods to stand after they come out of the microwave oven is that when microwaves cook food, they stimulate the molecules to vibrate very rapidly against each other. And that makes friction, just as when you rub your hands together. So after you take the food out of the microwave oven, it continues to cook because these molecules don't just stop on a dime. They continue to vibrate and this creates heat. So rather than cu cut into the chicken right now, we would wait for the standing time and then cut into it to see if it's done. If it's not done at that point, then you can put it back into the microwave oven for additional time. But if you cut into the chicken right when the buzzer beeps,
you're going to let a lot of steam and carryover heat escape and then it probably won't get done the way it's supposed to. I think a lot of uh, people cook foods in the microwave oven and they don't like the results because what they've done is overcook the food and it's because they're not patient and they don't wait for the food to have the carryover cooking time before they cut into it or decide that it's done. So let's just pretend that we've had the carryover cooking time and at this point we can move it to a lovely serving platter here and maybe Ann could put some garnishes on there. And this is a really quick family meal with a lot less calories since we took the skin off. One of the things when you're having the standing time, make sure that your chicken rack is not placed in the direct line of the air conditioning vent because it will cool down so quickly that it won't allow the food to have that natural carryover cooking time. And we're arranging our chicken pieces actually on this platter as we did on our meat rack for cooking in that we're having the thicker, more meaty portions to the outer edges and for instance the handle of the drumstick to the inner edges because the microwave energy is going to penetrate the food from the outer edges to the inside. I guess a lot of things that you do in microwave cooking get automatic after a while and if you just practice a new recipe every day pretty soon you will do things as automatically as someone who's been cooking for many years in the microwave oven. This particular recipe is from the first book that Ann and I wrote and it's called Microwave Know-How. We hope that you'll like this recipe and that we will have given you some know-how in your own kitchens. The next recipe we'd like to prepare for you is Cornish hens with veggie stuffing. And this is a delightful alternative to the traditional bread stuffing that many of us have used to stuff our poultry. Cece's going to combine the celery, carrots, onion, and we have tarragon and thyme as our seasoning for this recipe. While she's mixing that, I'm going to go ahead and get our Cornish hen prepared. We're going to sprinkle lightly some salt and pepper on the inside cavity. And we're not going to sprinkle any on the exterior because this could draw some of the microwave energy out and have a tendency to dry our little Cornish hen. After Cece has the mixture combined, I'm going to stuff our Cornish hen and then we'll truss it. And one of the things we'd like to share with you is an alternative to the traditional ball of trussing twine and scissors. We both have children, as we mentioned, and I don't know about you, but we found it's hard to keep a ball of string and a pair of scissors in the drawer. So we came up with the idea of using a dispenser of dental floss. It doesn't matter whether you use the waxed or the unwaxed, but we speak from experience when we say, don't use the mint flavored. We had green racing stripes in one of our birds that we did for our program. I'll say another thing. Your kids will never walk off with a dental floss. In fact, I don't think mine touch any. <laughs> okay. When you cook uh, Cornish hens just in the microwave oven, we like to use 70% power. And for the two Cornish hens, it will take about 20 minutes. It is possible to cook the hens on high power, but we think that they're so tiny and tender that they get um, cooked more tenderly if you use 70%, which is a reduced power level. How are you doing with the stuffing oh, here? I'm, we're getting there. Our cavity opening is not too large, so it's, we can't shove in a lot at one time, but we will get our veggies inserted. I can smell those delightful seasonings that we have, the tarragon and the thyme, and I think that we would really enjoy having this. While Anne is working on that, I'm going to tell you about using aluminum foil in the microwave oven. Some of you may have heard years ago that you should not use metal in the microwave oven. 
Well, it's true that you should not use metal pans because the metal reflects the microwaves and they wouldn't cook the food. But within the past year, the UL or the Underwriters Laboratory has done, done extensive testing with aluminum foil and foil TV dinner trays. And now it is safe for all brands of microwave oven for you to use small amounts of aluminum foil to cover the parts of a chicken or any other food that are small and will tend to overcook. So on this Cornish hen here that we've already prepared, I'm crimping a small amount of aluminum foil over the ends of the drumsticks. Now when the microwaves hit the foil, they will be reflected off of the drumstick ends and they will enter the rest of the Cornish hen that needs more cooking. I think Anne is ready now to show you how to truss the Cornish hen for microwave cooking. It's important to hold the parts of a whole piece of poultry closely to the body because anytime you get a part of poultry that's flaring out, such as a wing tip, it creates an antenna for the microwaves and they radiate toward the antenna. So you don't ever want to have the wing sticking out, rather you want to tie it tightly to the body of the bird so that it all cooks evenly. And that's what Anne has done. She's put the string over the wings and under the, the Cornish hen and she's also tied the legs closely together so that they will cook more evenly. We're going to go ahead and tuck the remaining vegetables right in the opening here because as our Cornish hens cook, the vegetables will lose some of the moisture and we will have some shrinkage. The principles that we've just talked about in doing Cornish hens would be the same in cooking a large piece of poultry such as a turkey. So you can use all of these same techniques if you would like to do a larger bird. All right, we need to put some more aluminum foil on the drumsticks here. And also, you can put some aluminum foil uh, on the wing tips here if you'd like. Now, if you're going to cook these in the microwave oven, we would advise that you take some bottled brown sauce and perhaps some paprika and brush the Cornish hens with the brown sauce and then sprinkle it with paprika to give it um, a prettier color. Today we're going to put these Cornish hens into the convection oven and we're going to cook by combination and what that means is the microwave is going to cycle first into the convection mode and then alternately into the microwave mode. The benefit of this is that the Cornish hens will cook faster but they'll get brown all by themselves without having to add any cosmetics as we say. So we're going to put these in the oven and you use the rack in the convection oven when you put food in here. Now this Rubbermaid dish is safe both for the convection oven and the microwave. So we're able to cook in this oven in any fashion that we like. We'll touch combination and number four and then we'll do 45 minutes. It isn't necessary to do any rotating when we're using the convection microwave combination cooking. If we were doing just microwaving, we would stop midway through and rotate our Cornish hens to get more even cooking. Cece, we're preparing this recipe in the combination microwave oven and using the recipe from J.C. Penney's Microwave Oven Cookbook. I notice you have hot pads in hand and you'll need that to handle the hot dish as you remove it. When you use a microwave oven, you don't need pot holders, but you have to remember when you're using the combination mode that this dish will be hot. This is one of our favorite dishes for the microwave as well as the combination oven because um, it has this rack for meat that is a separate part of the dish. Then you can also make a casserole such as lasagna or some other groups of foods in the three-quart dish. And it also comes with a lid which is handy for storing food. I'm ready for dinner. Looks good to me.
combination microwave convection ovens like this full-size unit from J.C. Penney offer the best of both worlds, the speed of microwave cooking with the traditional qualities of conventionally cooked food. You can set the oven to cook in four different ways, convection, broil, combination, and microwave. Cooking by convection heat is as easy as cooking with a conventional oven. The difference is that convection ovens work by circulating hot air into the oven cavity. The hot air is circulated around the food, cooking it quickly and evenly. This gentle, thorough distribution of heat lets you cook even the most delicate foods, like pastries or souffles, with confidence. And meats or poultry cook with a beautiful, even browning. For convection cooking, you can use the same cookware that you use for regular oven use. For best browning results, bake layer cakes, breads, and muffins in pans which have shiny sides and dull bottoms. Bake pies in dull, dark pans. Bake cookies on a shiny cookie sheet with low sides. Bake angel food and sponge cakes in an ungreased 10 by 4 inch tube pan. Combination cooking needs cookware which is heat and microwave oven safe. Oven glassware and ceramic dishes are ideal for combination cooking. Some microwave safe plastics are also heat proof up to specific oven temperatures. Check manufacturers recommendations concerning the use of their plasticware in conventional ovens. Just remember Cookware, as well as the oven, will get hot in a convection combination oven. You'll need pot holders to handle the cookware, just as you do with regular ovens. Cooking time for combination cooking is generally one-third to one-half the time of conventional cooking. You'll be cooking smarter and faster with a combination oven. We've never met anyone who doesn't like lasagna, but there aren't any of us that like to cook these noodles to make the lasagna. Today, we're going to share with you a way that you're going to be able to prepare your lasagna and not have to cook a noodle before layering it. We're going to use prepared spaghetti sauce in making ours because this is a quick way to do it. If you would like, you could use one quart of your own homemade spaghetti sauce in lieu of the prepared. Cece is pouring our spaghetti sauce into our two-quart batter bowl. And then to get all of the ingredients out, she's going to pour some of the wine into the jars, replace the lid, give it a little shake, and then pour it in with the rest of our spaghetti sauce. She'll do this with each of our jars. You know, this also comes in the low sodium variety as well as just the regular spaghetti sauce. Okay, Cece, now we're going to add our nutmeg and our garlic powder and combine this with the spaghetti sauce and wine. We like to use the wine for the flavoring that it gives in this dish, but perhaps you choose not to and you could substitute water in lieu of it. But remember that the alcohol is actually going to evaporate during the cooking process. Cece is going to place this in the microwave oven after she has covered it with plastic wrap. The reason we're using plastic wrap, this holds in the maximum amount of heat and moisture and will help speed the heating of this prepared spaghetti sauce. We're going to microwave this on high for six minutes. The reason we want to start with our sauce hot, this is going to help our noodles to begin cooking better. Cece, while our spaghetti sauce is getting ready, the next thing we need to do is get our spinach ready. This is really going to be healthy lasagna because we're going to have a vegetarian lasagna made with, spaghetti, with spinach. We have already cooked our packages of spinach, and you'll note that we still have them in the cardboard cartons. Since these came with a foil wrapper, we needed to remove the wrapper before we placed them in the microwave oven. But we did not open the packaging, and you'll notice that it certainly wasn't airtight, that it has loosened upon cooking. 
we now have it cool enough that we can handle it, and Cece and I will each squeeze one of the packages to remove as much of the moisture as we can from our chopped spinach. Also, when we're using recipes that call for chopped broccoli, we would use the same procedure. You know, a lot of these 10 ounce boxes are covered with wax paper. In that case, you do not need to remove the wax paper before microwaving it, but you do need to put it on a paper plate or a paper towel in the microwave oven. Because on the wrapper, there's printing ink. And if you place it directly on the floor of the microwave oven, you might be reading directions for chopped spinach on the floor of your oven for the next couple of years. Now this juice that was cooked from the spinach is very nutritious and you could save this in a jar to use in a soup later on. But we don't need it for this recipe so we're going to remove it. Cece, I believe our sauce mixture might be ready for us to continue with the preparation of our lasagna. When Cece brings our sauce over, we're going to remove one and a half cups and pour into another utensil and use that at a later step in the preparation of this recipe. After she has removed the one and a half cups of sauce, we're then going to add the chopped packages of spinach and we will continue mixing that with the sauce that remains in our batter ball. I think we need yet. just a little bit more. One of the great things about these mixing bowls is that they also have measurements along the side so that you can see um, how much you're pouring in there. You know, a lot of people pick up a measuring cup in the air like this and they say, oh yeah, that's a half a cup, okay? The correct way to measure in a measuring cup is to do a deep knee bend, which also exercises your thigh muscles, and see where the level of the liquid is. You didn't realize you were going to get an exercise lesson along the way too, did you? While I add the chopped olives to this part of the spaghetti sauce, Cece is combining the chopped spinach in that sauce and we can then begin to layer our lasagna. One of the important things to remember when making lasagna using these uncooked noodles is to get the sauce hot before you layer the uncooked noodles with it. Uh, since you really need a lot of heat and moisture to soften the noodles, this is important in getting the final product done correctly. We're going to use this rectangular utensil and it's going to be just perfect for doing our lasagna. Cece is going to pour one half of the mixture in our two quart batter bowl into the bottom of our lasagna pan. When she has this spread in the bottom, we will then start placing our noodles into the mixture that she has put in the bottom. We're going to position three noodles so that they are horizontal in the pan, and then our fourth noodle we're going to need to break so that it fits into the pan. We recommend that you press the noodles down to make contact with the mixture that is in the bottom of the pan because this is going to help these raw noodles to take on some of this moisture and to begin the tenderizing of them. We just like to use the edge of the counter to break our noodle so that it will fit the end of our lasagna pan. Now we put half of our cottage cheese mixture on top of the noodles and you'll notice how easy it is to spread this mixture when the noodles are uncooked. If you've ever made lasagna before where you pre-cook the noodles, you know when you spread the cheese sometimes the noodle just goes all the way down to the other end of the dish. So this even makes the assembling the casserole a lot easier as well. And what are the other ingredients in here with okay. the cottage cheese? We have the cottage cheese. We have one beaten egg, and we have some pepper in with this, as well as some Parmesan cheese. And we have combined all of that together. And then we're going to use some mozzarella cheese next on this layer. And then we're going to repeat our layers again. Some of you might be interested to know how we got into this business. Um, about 1979, 
we were teaching microwave cooking classes and we realized that people were asking the same questions all the time. And back in 1979, only 16% of American homes had microwave ovens. But we went down to the food editor of our local newspaper and volunteered our services as home economists writing a regular microwave cooking column for the newspaper. Well, she liked our idea, but we had to be interviewed by several other editors who were above her in rank. And one of them happened to be a, a man who was using his microwave oven as a bread box. So by the time we talked to him, we figured we had the job because if you're using your microwave oven for a bread box, you're really not getting all of the fun and the benefits out of using it. You might note that I have placed the noodles at the opposite end of this utensil so that I have the broken edge of the noodle at the other end now. We feel that this is going to help it stay together when we're ready to cut our nice uniform slices. You know, another benefit of cooking the noodles this way is that you don't need to drain the noodles and lose some of the nutrients that would be uh, rinsed off after cooking them conventionally. And of course, in Texas where we live, it's so hot all the time that if you cook um, the noodles in a big three-quart uh, pot of boiling water, it would just heat up your kitchen so much that air conditioning bills would be sky high. So that's another benefit of putting the uncooked noodles in the dish. Research has shown that many people are eating more of the complex carbohydrates and pasta is a wonderful complex carbohydrate to be including in our meals. And this is especially helpful for those of you who are runners. We now are pouring the remaining one half cup of prepared sauce that has the chopped dark olives in it over the top and we'll spread this out and then we're going to cover this. This is crucial to this recipe because we want to hold in the maximum amount of heat and moisture to help tenderize those noodles. The success of this recipe depends on covering it tightly with a good lid or heavy-duty plastic wrap. This three-quart Rubbermaid dish that we're using has this wonderful lid that can go right on top. And if you have leftovers, it's also handy to keep the lid over it in the refrigerator. It's time to cook our lasagna. We'll put this in and start it out on high power. After it has cooked for five minutes on high, we will then reduce it to 70% of power. That looks wonderful. Wait, we're going to need to leave the cover on for the standing time. This is critical to this recipe. We need to allow it to stand for at least 20 minutes because those noodles would not be done if we would cut into it at this point. After 20, it could even go for 30 minutes. Then you'll be able to cut nice uniform pieces of lasagna and enjoy. The thing I like about it is having leftover lasagna because you can freeze it in a microwave safe uh, dish such as those made by Anchor Hawking and then you can reheat and uh, defrost on 70% power and the lasagna will taste as fresh as when we cooked it just now. Cece, I noticed that you're using a nylon utensil to cut our lasagna and this is a good choice because we don't want to use a sharp knife in any of the plastic cookware because it could leave marks in it. That looks fantastic. We'll have a little extra parmesan that we can have with it and to you and to you. Here's to your good health.
it's time to prepare our catch of the day and we've chosen to fix healthy halibut. However, if the halibut is not readily available for you, you could substitute flounder fillets. In cooking, there are two words that a lot of people get confused. The word that we use in describing fish is spelled F-I-L-L-E-T, and it should be pronounced fillet. If you're speaking about meat cookery, the French word F-I-L-E-T, it's pronounced fillet, and that's the proper way to talk about a fillet of beef. So you can maybe tell some of your friends, if they're saying it wrong, that it's fish fillets. This recipe that we're doing today is from the American Heart Association. And I converted it for our third cookbook, which is for men only. Uh, what we've already done is cook the vegetables that are going on top of the fish fillets for three minutes. And Anne is adding the pimentos and the parsley now. Cece, you'll note that when I removed the plastic wrap, I pulled the wrap back toward myself so that the steam could go out from the front so that we would not end up with a steam burn. We're going to recover and let this stand for just a few minutes while we finish preparing our halibut. We're going to use some seasonings on our halibut steaks, which we have placed in opposite directions to give more uniform cooking. This is a 12-inch baking sheet from Anchor Hawking. And as you see, you can use it for just about any food that will fit, fit on it. It's also safe in the conventional or the convection oven up to 400 degrees. This is really beautiful fresh dill that we're using. Um, another thing to remember about herbs when you have them dried is not to store them near your stove. Fresh herbs or dried herbs lose their volatile flavors very rapidly so that you should store them in a cool place. All right, one thing we're going to do since we've cooked the vegetables is to pour off the moisture that has collected. Vegetables have quite a lot of water in them and we need to pour it off before we put the vegetables on top of the fish and I'll let Ann do that now. By keeping our plastic wrap on the top of our cook and measure bowl, we can expose the pouring spout and our liquid will drain very quickly and easily into this custard cup and yet we will still have our vegetables in the cook and measure bowl. The reason that we cook the onion and bell pepper and the mushrooms before we put it on top of the fish is that fish is one of the fastest things you can cook in your microwave oven. In fact, when you're fixing fish for dinner, you need to get your whole group to the table and in their seats before you put this fish in the microwave oven. Because from this point on, it's only four minutes. And you know, Cece, one of the beautiful things about preparing fish is that we're going to get our omega-3 fatty acids. And these lower the level of triglycerides and cholesterol in our blood. And it also helps prevent blood clots. It's recommended that we prepare fish twice a week for our diets. This really looks pretty, I think, with all these multicolored, low-calorie vegetables on top of it. After Cece puts our vegetables on top, we have combined the wine and the lemon juice, and we're going to pour this over the top to poach our fish. If you prefer not to use the wine, then you could substitute broth instead. The proper covering for fish is wax paper. That's because it holds in the heat, but it doesn't allow drops of moisture to condense on the back and drip on our food. So we'll just lay a piece across the fish before we put it into the oven. In checking for the doneness of our fish, the National Fisheries Institute recommends that the fish not flake completely for our test of doneness. If we've done this, it's gone too far. The fish should still have some translucency to it because it will continue to cook as it comes to the table. Have you got your fork ready? We're ready to see about our doneness test. Oh, how attractive. You'll notice that the fish has 
developed a, an opaqueness to it, and yet if we move some of the vegetables to the side, we might see some slight translucency in the very center area. This will complete cooking as we take it to the table. And Cece, we're only going to have 188 calories per serving with this delicious dish. Oh, I feel thinner already. <laughs> You wouldn't try to run an office without a telephone or typewriter, would you? By the same token, would you microwave without the proper utensils? Many people do, but not having the right dishes definitely limits the success of recipes. There are certain essentials needed in every kitchen. First, check the cookware you already have in your kitchen to see which are microwave safe. Remember that metal reflects microwaves so metal pans should not be used in a microwave oven. If you're not sure whether your other cookware is safe to use, here's how to find out. Put one empty piece of cookware into the oven. Fill a one cup glass measure with cool water and put it in the oven so that it isn't touching the cookware to be tested. Turn the microwave on high for one and a half minutes. If the water is warm, and the cookware you're testing is cool, then it is safe to use in your microwave oven. But if the cookware is warm, it is not microwave safe. You'll probably find lots of cookware in your kitchen that are microwave safe. But you'll also need some new cookware, specifically designed for microwave use. Here are some special microwave cookware pieces we can't live without because they can be used to cook many types of food and are easy to clean. You can also use many of them in a conventional oven. Take this plastic colander. It's a wonderful example of the Rubbermaid set. We use the colander for cooking ground meats so that the fat can drain through the holes. It is also useful for washing vegetables and draining spaghetti. The colander is part of this seven-piece set of Rubbermaid cookware that stacks together for easy storage in less than seven inches of space. It contains two casseroles, a three-quart and a one-quart, which can hold most any recipe. The set also includes a lid which fits the casseroles, and it has two covers for refrigerator or freezer storage. Also from Rubbermaid is this three-quart rectangular dish with meat rack and cover. It's great for cooking meat, fish, poultry, lasagna, and cakes. You can't make a big batch of spaghetti sauce, soup, or stew without one of these three-quart versatility pans from Anchor Hawking. I was born in Texas, so I also make lots of chili in mine. Now the next piece just may get more use than any other piece of microwave cookware. This cook and measure bowl from Rubbermaid can be used for measuring, mixing, and microwaving. It has a handy pouring spout and a handle which always stays cool. Another piece of cookware you're likely to use every day is this Rubbermaid bacon and meat rack. Besides cooking meat, it's great for reheating sandwiches or melting cheese on top, heating frozen pizza, or for cooking several small items at once. For microwave baking, these Anchor Hawking utensils can't be beat. Besides baking cakes, this fluted two pan can also be used for meatloaf, cornbread, making a fresh vegetable wreath, or a rice ring. It holds three and a half quarts. Anchor Hawking also makes a smaller ring pan, which holds eight cups and can be used for a smaller quantity of the same foods. A tube pan is ideal for microwaving because it helps the food cook faster and more evenly. 
Anchor Hawking's muffin pan can also poach eggs, make miniature cheesecakes, or individual portions of many other foods. Remember to line each compartment with cupcake liners when making baked goods before putting the batter in. This 12-inch baking sheet made by Anchor Hawking has multiple uses. You can make individual uh, appetizers on it, microwave groups of food, or make desserts such as granola bars, which are a nutritious treat. Most of these utensils are also safe to use in a conventional or convection oven up to 400 degrees. It's always smart to have cookware that can do double duty. After you've cooked all this great food in your microwave oven, it's handy to have microwave safe storage containers for the leftovers. These freeze, heat, and serve dishes made by Anchor Hawking are perfect. They come in assorted sizes for small or large servings. Besides making it easy to reheat leftovers, they can also be used for primary cooking of small amounts of food. It may be fun to cook, but it's sure no fun to clean up. One of the best things about microwave cookware is that it's so easy to clean. That's because this cookware from microwave is designed with no stick properties for easy cleanup. Most microwave cookware can go from freezer to oven to table in minutes and then into the dishwasher. Now let's get back to cooking. Now we're talking my language, Tex-Mex. This is one of our favorite recipes and it starts with a pound of ground beef. Most people who are in a hurry will pull a pound of ground beef out of their freezer and defrost it in the microwave and then make dinner out of it. We want to show you before you put the meat into the freezer, you should make a donut out of the meat. And this way, it will be twice as fast to defrost. Because when you have a brick of ground beef, the last place that gets defrosted is the center. But if you'll just take your fingers and make a donut shape in the middle, then it will defrost twice as fast. Now, when we defrost foods in the microwave, we always remove the shrink wrap that was on the meat and we will also remove the styrofoam tray and then we will transfer it into the utensil for our recipe. Now if this were frozen ground beef what we would do is either defrost it with the auto defrost on the penny's oven or you can use our speedy method which would be to microwave it one minute on high and then scrape off all the meat that has defrosted and remove it from the microwave. Then we put the remaining chunk back in, one more minute on high, and scrape it again. And after about three minutes on high power, you'd have this whole donut of frozen ground beef defrosted. Now, this is already defrosted, so what we're going to do is break up the meat in this utensil by Rubbermaid, which is a colander. This utensil has holes in the bottom, just like a vegetable strainer. And the beauty of this piece is that as the ground beef cooks, the fat will drain out the holes in the bottom. Now the fat in a pound of ground beef is about four to 500 calories. So if you are draining off the ground beef when you cook it, you're saving all of that saturated fat. All right, we're breaking up the ground beef so that it will cook more evenly. We don't want to have meatloaf here. And if you leave it in a chunk, it will cook together. It will clump together and it won't be separate uh, ground beef. Now on top of the ground beef, we will put our bell peppers and we'll put our onions and also the celery. Now we don't stir this in with the meat right now. The first thing we're going to do is microwave it on high for three minutes. And we'll let Ann put this in the oven for us. Okay. We're not going to use a cover on this. It isn't necessary. It cooks fine without covering it first. One of the beauties of using this type of combination utensil is that actually our colander is suspended over the utensil that is beneath it. 
you wouldn't want to set a colander into a glass pie plate, for instance, because as the fat would drain through the holes, it could actually come back up through the holes. And we heard of one lady who had the bottom of her colander burn out. But if you would use a combination such as which Rubbermaid is designed, you wouldn't have that problem. One of the things we like to do is to saute the onion and celery and green pepper at the same time with our ground beef. And I hear us at the halfway point, Cece. Okay. One thing you have to do is stir the ground beef after half of the cooking. Because if you don't, it will all cook together in a one clump of meat. The other reason we stir it is to redistribute the uh, cooked portions with the uncooked portions. As you can see, this that I'm bringing up right in the center of the casserole is really raw, whereas some of the rest of this around the outside, do you see how brown this is starting to get? Now, if you don't stir this together, you'll end up with it, some of it very hard and chewy, and the rest of it will still be undercooked. All right, we're going to put this back in the oven for the final three minutes, and then we'll assemble the sauce. One of the things that we like to do with doing our sauteing of the vegetables this way is that we think of allowing one additional minute per cup of vegetables on top of the ground beef. It takes five minutes to saute one pound of ground beef, and by adding one cup of chopped vegetables, we're going to allow six minutes on high to cook it. Okay, let's put this back in okay. the oven. The you other thing you can do uh, when you saute vegetables in the microwave to save calories is that you don't use butter or margarine to saute the vegetables. In this case, we're doing it simultaneous, simultaneously with the cooking of the meat. But if you want to cook bell pepper, uh, onion, and celery for some other recipe, then you can just put it in a measuring cup and cover it with plastic wrap and it will cook in its own moisture. So that's another way of eliminating a lot of the calories that we Americans get in fat every day. Cece, I hear the beep. Let's check our meat mixture and see if it's ready to combine with the rest of the ingredients for our recipe. When you're cooking ground beef, the way to tell that it's all done is to stir it because when it first comes out of the microwave oven, it's still going to have a little pink here and there. And as you can see, some of the meat is already brown. So what we will do is stir it to break up the chunks of meat. And as we stir it, the carryover cooking time that happens after the food comes out of the microwave oven will finish cooking those small pieces of meat that were pink before. Now I think you can see that there's no more pink left. And so we know that this meat is done. Now Anne is going to show you the real beauty of this pan. We're going to place our colander on some folded paper toweling because there is some grease on the bottom. And then we'll be able to pour the grease that has collected in the bottom of our utensil and dispose of this readily. This is the fat we were talking about that will save you 500 calories in a pound of ground beef. And as you can see, this is a six ounce custard cup and there's about four ounces of grease and other collected um, liquids from the ground beef. Now, because we don't like to spend a lot of time in the kitchen cleaning, we're going to use the same utensil that was under the colander to finish the recipe. So what we do is transfer the cooked meat from the colander into the same casserole that was underneath. That way, the only thing that we have to wash is the colander and then the utensil from the finished recipe. And Cece, I found it's helpful if I can take my dish brush and just quickly put it under the faucet to get any particles of the meat that might be perhaps caught in the openings on the colander. Now this is where Ann and I have our biggest fights because I'm a native Texan and Ann is originally from Ohio. And this recipe calls from, for two to four teaspoons of chili powder. And of course, I always want the four teaspoons and Ann always wants the two teaspoons. So we usually settle on three teaspoons of chili powder. But if you're making this recipe, you can decide how hot to make it by using a different amount of the chili powder. Another ingredient in this recipe is a can of tomato paste. Now, um, if you look in the grocery store, you may see some tomato paste 
that says no salt added. If you can find that kind of tomato paste, it has only 170 milligrams of sodium in the whole can. This can that we have here is regular tomato paste. Instead of 170 milligrams of sodium, it has 2,070 grams of sodium. And that is really a lot. Now we're going to show you a neat trick how to get the tomato paste out of the can without a rubber scraper. What you do is you open one lid with the can opener and then open the bottom lid. And then to get the tomato paste out, you just push down on the other end and zip, it all comes out of the can. Now the only other problem you have here is that the recipe also calls for a can of water. And your problem is now you don't have a can anymore. <laughs> You've got an empty cylinder. So in that case, if you go back to your high school fractions, you know that a six ounce can of water would be three-fourths cup. So that's what we have measured out here. And we're going to pour that into the recipe. Now after we stir this mixture together, we put it back in the microwave ovens for six minutes. And then we'll show you how to eat your hat and make this super sombrero supper. We're going to cover this dish because it will help hold in the maximum amount of heat and moisture to finish cooking it. You'll notice that the lid I'm holding has an indentation. And this is a steam escape, or if you're using a temperature probe for a recipe, your temperature probe could be inserted into the casserole through this opening. However, we want to be careful in the placement of the lid so that it is directed away from the handles. You'll note that I have the opening to the front so that when I remove the hot dish from the microwave oven, I'm not going to have steam coming out toward one of the handles and possibly burn myself. All right, and let's put it in the oven okay. for three minutes, then we'll stir it once, and then we'll do three more minutes, and we'll be ready to assemble our super sombrero supper for you. And if you'll get our meat sauce out of the microwave oven, we'll show everybody how to assemble the final, final sombrero supper. You'll need a 12-inch round tray. It does not have to be microwave safe because it does not get cooked any farther in the microwave oven. All we do is stir the meat sauce and we'll mound it into the center of our 12-inch round tray. This becomes the, the crown of the sombrero. And you'll see how, why we say you can eat your hat this time. Okay, so just pile it up right in the center of the tray. And then Ann is going to take some of the chips and start making our hat brim. You know, Stacey, I like to prepare this when I know that we're going to have all of our family at the table for the dinner. But sometimes with the various schedules we have, we can't all sit down at the same time. And so we let each family member assemble his or her own sombrero. Now, chips are not very nutritious. In fact, about 10 of these chips would be 150 calories, and they would contain 233 milligrams of sodium. Now, this is quite a bit uh, when you think that people should not have more than about 700 milligrams of sodium per day. So instead of using these chips, if you'd like to lower your calories and your sodium, you could take some corn tortillas and put the meat sauce in the tortilla and roll it up. And then you would only get 65 calories for one corn tortilla. And wait till you hear this. One milligram of sodium is all there is in a corn tortilla. It is practically non-existent. In fact, if you tried to put one milligram of sodium into the palm of your hand, it would be a grain of salt. So that it would be a healthier way to eat this dish. However, you know, being from Texas, we like these chips. Now, um, the shredded cheese goes on the top of our Mexican straw hat here. And then Anne has just some garnishes that you could put on just to add a little green color to it. We also have some sodium in our cheese. And celery happens to be one of the vegetables that has the highest sodium content. So if you're trying to cut down in your sodium, use the no salt added tomato paste. And remember that you might try using some cheese that wouldn't be as high in the sodium count either. Olay.
Now we're going to do a recipe for you that's not only beautiful to look at, but it's so good for you. We're going to use some broccoli and cauliflowerettes, which we have already made by trimming the stems. Now the first thing you do in vegetable microwaving is to weigh the vegetables. In microwave cooking, the amount of vegetables that you put into the oven determines the amount of cooking time. And the more vegetables you have, the longer it will take to microwave. We have three pounds of vegetables here. And for this particular recipe, we would microwave them for four minutes per pound. So if you multiply four times three, you would know that you would microwave these vegetables for 12 minutes. Now the unique utensil that we're going to use for our recipe is called a fluted tube pan. Many of you probably have seen cakes baked in this pan, but we're going to show you another use for the pan, which uh, you can make meatloaf, you can do cornbread, and you can make a rice ring, but today we're going to do this vegetable wreath. The first step in assembling this wreath is to put the, the broccoli upside down in one ring around the bottom of the bunt pan. Anne's going to help me here. You have to remember that when the recipe is finished, we're going to turn it upside down on a tray, just the way you would unmold a jello mold. So when you assemble it, remember that you're looking at it upside down. The reason that broccoli and cauliflower are so nutritious for you is that they're members of the carciferous family of vegetables. This means that they are good uh, for a cancer preventative diet. Other members of this family would include Brussels sprouts and cabbage, but all the vegetables have a different microwaving time. So if you were doing Brussels sprouts and cabbage, you would probably microwave them about five to six minutes per pound, whereas these broccoli and cauliflowerettes just take about four minutes per pound. Okay, after we've got the bottom row of, of broccoli, we're crisscrossing the cauliflower and we're putting the blossoms toward the outside of the tube pan and toward the tube itself. We've made a whole row of cauliflower. And now our next row is going to be broccoli again. You just alternate the vegetables until you've run out of vegetables. In fact, in uh, this recipe, you can mound the vegetables up over the top of the bunt pan and they will all cook down. You know, Cece, whenever we're entertaining, I like to use this size utensil to make a large wreath as we're doing. But sometimes for just our family, I like to use this smaller ring mold because it holds an amount that would be just right for our family for a dinner. They've done lots of studies up at Cornell University and determined that cooking vegetables in the microwave oven retains more vitamins than vegetables cooked by any other method. And one of the reasons is that you need very little water to microwave vegetables. For instance, in doing this wreath, we are not going to add any additional water. We're just going to use our plastic wrap to cover the uh, washed vegetables. And they will cook in their own moisture. You now, vegetables have a lot of moisture. In fact, there are some vegetables that are about 75 percent moisture. That's why they're also low in calories besides being very nutritious. I think we have all of our good sized veggies packed in the pan here and we are now going to cover it with plastic wrap because that's going to hold in the maximum amount of heat and moisture for more uniform cooking. Due to the size of this utensil, I think it'd be best if we go ahead and use two pieces of plastic wrap so that we can completely cover the utensil to hold in that heat and moisture. Sometimes you can find plastic wrap that's wider, and in that case you would only need one strip to go all the way across. But it's very important in order to get the vegetables to be tender that you cover them tightly with the plastic wrap because you need to hold in the maximum amount of steam and also you like that moisture that condenses on the back of the plastic wrap because it drips back down on the vegetables and it makes them nice and tender. Okay, Ann, would you like to put that in the okay. microwave? We're going to cook our vegetable wreath on 
high power because the vegetables will be tender with high power cooking in the microwave. We're first going to set our power level at high and then we're going to indicate that we would like this to cook for 12 minutes and we will get it started and be ready to have our wreath for you in a short time. That sounds like our vegetable wreath. We'll take it out and be ready to compress it and turn our veggie wreath out. It really doesn't take long to cook a lot of vegetables in the microwave. All right, now this is an important part of the recipe is that you need to take a utensil that will fit into the pan and push down on the vegetables so that when you unmold it, all the vegetables will hold together. Okay, so you do this all the way around and push about medium hard. You know, we don't want to make a pancake out of it, but still, we don't want it to fall apart when we unmold it. So we'll do this around the outside and then around the inside. And then we'll take our plastic wrap off and put our serving tray over top. Now, if we did this right, we're going to have a beautiful vegetable wreath here for you. Hold your breath. Voila. There we go. And if Ann has some cherry tomatoes over there, we'll show you how to put um, some decorations on it. Okay. This would really make a beautiful centerpiece for a party or at holiday times. And uh, the good thing about having a low calorie food like this at a party is that people who are trying to eat right and hold their weight down will have a nutritious thing to nibble on. Well, we will garnish around the side of our veggie wreath. And then as an accompaniment, which would really be nice with this, is to use a fresh herb yogurt dip. And we can just snip some fresh herbs into yogurt and garnish it with some fresh parsley. And people can drizzle that over it. And um, that will give us a nice healthy dip for our dish. Another great thing about yogurt is that it has so much calcium in it that it's really good uh, for osteoporosis prevention. Uh, all of us need to, to have about a thousand milligrams a day of calcium in our diets in order for our bones to be healthy in our teeth and our fingernails and everything. So this is really a winning recipe. It has uh, both vitamins and cancer prevention and calcium to boot. So we really think this is a winner and we hope you'll enjoy making this in your home. And cut. This is our favorite bran muffin recipe, and the first step in making the batter is to get the one cup of water boiling in the microwave oven. And Anne has our water back here in the small microwave oven, and as soon as it's ready, we'll take it out, and we'll combine it with the one cup of 100% bran cereal. The reason these bran muffins are so good for you is that they contain a lot of fiber and this is extremely important in preventing certain types of cancer. It's recommended that you have about 30 grams of fiber every day. And to give you an example of how much a bran muffin can contribute to that, one bran muffin has three grams of fiber. So that's really 10% of the fiber that you need all day long. Of course, if you have two bran muffins, that's six grams of fiber. So you're 20% of your day's requirement. Uh, Anne has combined the bran, the bran with the water to soften it, and in the meantime, I'm going to cream the margarine here, and we'll add the sugar, and then we'll add the eggs. It it's, might be interesting to you to know that one of our students at a cooking class one time made this recipe and left out the eggs by mistake, and we found out that this recipe actually works without the eggs. 
So if you're on a restricted diet for some reason and can't use eggs, you can also leave the eggs out. All right, also we have here our flour combined with the baking soda and some salt. And we're going to add this alternately to the margarine mixture with the buttermilk. The great thing about this recipe is that you can keep it in the refrigerator for a whole month because the batter will make 60 muffins. And unless you have a lot of people in for breakfast, I don't think you're going to be making 60 muffins all in one day. But it certainly is great to have this ready in the refrigerator because so many of us are eating breakfast on the run these days. Ann and I each have three children, and this is one of their favorites because they can just reach in the refrigerator, take the batter out, put it in the muffin pan and in three minutes in the microwave oven they can have a hot muffin for breakfast. So if, if you have children and they say I don't have time for breakfast you just say wait three minutes you're gonna have a bran muffin. And you don't have to actually microwave all six muffins at the same time. Sometimes we'll just go ahead and microwave one or two muffins and we'll show you when we get ready to do the placement in the muffin pan how we arrange them for that. We'll get all of our flour and sugar in with the buttermilk here. And then we'll add our softened bran mixture. And then the remaining bran that we did not soften because this is going to give more texture to our fiber in this recipe. And then we have our dates and our nuts. The utensil that I'm using to mix the batter in is Anchor Hawking's two-quart glass batter bowl. This is really a neat utensil to have because it's heat proof as well as being microwave safe and you can make candies in it, uh, soups, sauces, and all sorts of things like that. It has a spout which for this recipe we're going to use to pour the batter into the cupcake papers and it also has a handle and if you've ever made candy in the microwave oven you know how hot a utensil can get but this handle always stays cool. In microwave cooking, the utensil itself does not get hot. After the food cooks in the utensil, the hot food will make the dish warm. But the microwaves don't make the utensil warm. So therefore, if there's no food touching this handle, it stays cool all the time. You can see that this two-quart batter bowl is going to be well filled with all the ingredients for this recipe. We would transfer it to another type of storage container to keep in the refrigerator though because we use this batter bowl so often that we wouldn't want to have it in the refrigerator with the muffin mix in it. All right, while I continue to stir here, Anne is going to show you the microwave muffin pan also made by Anchor Hawking. We have a six compartment muffin pan and we can make six muffins or we could just do one or two at a time. We recommend using two paper liners in each compartment. If we were going to do just two muffins for breakfast, we would suggest that you place them opposite each other. That way the microwave energy can enter from all sides and it will be more uniform. If we were going to do three muffins for breakfast, then we would alternate our compartments and have every other one filled. But we're going to go ahead and do six because we're real hungry this morning. You can see what would happen if you cooked only three muffins and let's just say you filled up these three compartments. What will happen is that the muffin in the center won't get as many microwaves as these two because the microwaves enter the food from around the outside. So anytime you have an assortment of foods such as baked potatoes or artichokes, you always need to space them evenly and leave room in between so that the microwaves can cook the food evenly. All right, let's fill these about half full. It's helpful to use the double liners because of the steam that collects on the bottom. And whenever we're microwaving, we do like to use the double lined papers. I'm going to get a little bit more. We're going to have a generous half filling here. One reason that um, this batter is a little uh, more difficult to pour right now is that it's supposed to sit in the refrigerator for a little while uh, to kind of season. 
So since we've just mixed up this batter, it's uh, kind of lumpy right now. And if you were doing this and had the batter in the refrigerator, it would pour a lot more easily. These muffins can microwave on 100% power on high. And we're going to use a compact microwave oven which has 500 cooking watts. For this we're going to need to add some additional time which is approximately one-third of the time that we would use if we were having a 700 watt oven. This recipe calls for three to three and a half minutes on high. We're going to use four to four and a half minutes to cook these in our 500 watt microwave. In four minutes, we're going to have some muffins we can eat. I'm about ready for a muffin. How about you? I think so, and it won't be much longer. It only took four minutes to do our six muffins in the 500-watt microwave oven. And if we had done it in the 700-watt oven, it would have taken three minutes. I hear the muffins. And here they are. We can have some delicious, nutritious muffins right now. Well, that's sure not bad for three minutes. But just to show you a comparison, we made these muffins in the convection oven. They took 25 minutes at 350 degrees. And these are the microwave muffins that took about three minutes. Ann and I are living in the fast lane, and we really don't have enough time to wait 25 minutes for breakfast sometimes. But you can see that the brown color is very pretty on the conventionally cooked uh, muffins. But if you're in a hurry, these three-minute muffins are delicious. I can promise you that. And I don't know about your mom, but to my mom, dinner wasn't dinner without dessert. So for a dessert recipe today, we've chosen a cheesecake that not only looks good and tastes good, but it's very healthy for you. That's because it contains a lot of ricotta cheese and ingredients with calcium. This recipe has 219 milligrams of calcium in one serving. This is called Italian almond cheesecake because of the ricotta cheese and also the amaretta that will be in the recipe. The first ingredient in our cheesecake recipe is cream cheese. And Anne is going to show you how to soften it in the microwave oven. We need to remove the foil packaging that the cheese comes in before we place it into our two quart batter bowl to soften in the microwave oven. We like to use 50% of power to soften ch cream cheese and it will take two and a half minutes for an eight ounce package. This recipe is from our newspaper column, Microscope, which can now be read by 33 million people all across the United States. We hope that you read it in the food section of your local newspaper and that you like the recipes that Ann and I prepare for you. Let's see if the cream cheese is soft. I'm sure it will be. We don't want our cream cheese to be completely melted, but we do want it to be softened. And it's just perfect to add the rest of our ingredients to. We're going to add 2 thirds cup of sugar, and I'm going to use a portable mixer to combine this. We will also be adding eggs, and some amaretta and some cornstarch. One of the reasons we add the sugar first is so that it's well combined with the cream cheese because you wouldn't want to have grains of sugar in the batter. Mm. 
I'll let Cece add all three eggs and then we'll combine it. Using this handy two-quart batter bowl, you see we not only use it in the microwave oven, but we're using it as our utensil for mixing. And we'll have the handy pouring spout to pour our batter into our prepared crust. Cece is now going to add the cornstarch. And the ricotta cheese. The ricotta cheese in this recipe is what gives it all the calcium. The reason we need to have about a thousand milligrams a day of calcium is to avoid a condition in older age called osteoporosis, which is literally a condition where the bones are porous and they break. Some of you may not know this, but the twelfth leading cause of death in the United States is spinal fractures due to osteoporosis. Besides getting an adequate calcium in your diet, it also helps to get good exercise. Now the microwave oven can't help you with the exercise, but it certainly can help you prepare delicious foods containing lots of calcium. Cece, if you'll bring our measuring spoons, we do need to put our almond extract in yet. Combine that and then we'll be ready to pour it into our crust as soon as you sprinkle the top of the crust with some amaretta. All right, I'm gonna help Ann with this. And then we're going to use this Italian almond liqueur to sprinkle on our crust. Cece, if you'll position our utensil over a little closer, I'll go ahead and pour our prepared batter into the crust and we'll be able to place it in the microwave oven. We like to go ahead and use 70% of power whenever we're doing something like a cheesecake or a quiche. With the cheese or the milk mixture, we find that it cooks to a nice smooth uniformity if we use 70% of power. If we're preparing it on high, we sometimes would end with a curdled product and we certainly don't want that with this delicious dessert. You know, we get lots of letters to our newspaper column, but the, the one we hear most often is questions about power levels on ovens. So I'd like to explain to you while Ann is putting that into the oven what 70% power is. When your microwave oven is on high, it's operating at full strength. The magnetron tube cannot produce any more microwaves than it's producing. Now there's no such thing as a half of a microwave. So in order to have the oven cook more gently, what it does is cycle off and on in a percentage that you set. If you set the oven to cook on 70% power, what that means is that the oven is on high power for 70% of the time, or it's producing full strength microwaves for 70% of the time, and it turns off for 30% of the time. If you have a touch control oven, you would touch number seven, and that means 70%. If you touched number five, that would mean 50%. Some ovens have dials with words. And if your oven says medium high, that is equivalent to 70%. But if you can't find um, in your owner's manual what power levels that your oven has, Ann and I will be glad to answer the questions for you and we'll tell you about that later. You know, Cece, one of the things we find is that people sometimes feel intimidated about their microwave ovens. They don't feel comfortable with them. What we suggest is that you get your use and care manual and perhaps put a measuring cup with two cups of water in the microwave oven. Sit down with it. Get comfortable with it. It's not going to bite you and you can let it become your friend for helping you in the kitchen. Learn to program your microwave oven. As Cece mentioned, we do like to use the reduced power levels, and this does take a little bit of practice so that you feel comfortable doing it on your microwave oven. We also recommend that you perhaps prepare one new dish a day, and at the end of a week, you'll have seven new dishes that you can prepare. After you finished watching this videotape, you're already going to have five entrees, one for each day of the week. 
and show us a little cheesecake. Well, we'll let the oven show us that. Three minutes before we put the almonds on, and now we're going to check our cheesecake to see if it is done. We need to wiggle it just slightly, and we see that we do have some movement. This will finish cooking with our carryover cooking time. If we were to put this directly in the refrigerator, we would find that in a couple of hours it would be ready. It would be completely firm. However, Cece, if we had left this in the microwave oven until it was completely set, we wouldn't have a nice, smooth, creamy cheesecake. We would have one that was really a little on the dry side. So that's why we want to see some movement in our cheesecake when we remove it from the microwave oven. It's hard to believe that a piece of this cheesecake can be good for us, but it actually will provide us with 20% of our daily calcium requirement. To give you an idea of how much calcium you should have every day, 1,000 milligrams of calcium would be uh, a total of one cup of yogurt, one cup of skim milk, and one ounce of Swiss cheese. That's all you have to eat in order to get the, the maximum amount of calcium every day. We've read a lot of articles lately that say that the calcium pills are not nearly as good for you as the calcium that you get from real food. Anne and I hope that you've enjoyed all of our recipes today and I hope that you can see that you can really make some great things in the microwave oven. So when you cook something in the microwave and show it to somebody, they won't say, that came out of a microwave. They'll say, that came out of a microwave? And it's real food. Anne and I are former home economics teachers, and we'd like to think that you've learned some things today. We would also like to encourage you to write to us at the address at the end of this tape if you have any questions. Because we do receive so much mail, however, we would appreciate it if you would enclose a self-addressed stamped envelope with your question and Anne or I will reply personally to you. We hope now that you'll go and make some great waves in the kitchen. <laughs>